And we're very, very honored to, to have him back. And to that end, I'd like to uh, introduce Tracy Lavelle, associate, associate Professor and Chair of the History Department at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Welcome home. I, uh, well, thank you, uh, Daryl, for inviting me uh, back here. This is my third time uh, to present at this conference, and it's, uh, I consider it a real honor. And this is an amazing gathering. I'm just uh, really impressed with everything. Last night was, uh, was really inspiring, all the uh, exchanges and great events, the new uh, uh, stanzas for the alma mater. Uh, just I'm constantly amazed and impressed by what I see. Uh, developing over the years here. Um, so thank you, Daryl. And I also want to uh, recognize David Costa, who's going to present later and who's sitting over there, uh, because the two of them uh, really uh, welcomed me um, uh, to this work and uh, made my work a lot better uh, over the years. And uh, what I'm going to do is talk about um, a little bit about the book that I just recently published, and it wouldn't have been the same work without uh, the two of them, so thank you for that. So let me begin with the story of where I got the title of the book, The Catholic Calumet. Um, a delegation of Illinois Indians uh, on a diplomatic mission astonished the residents of New Orleans in 1730 with their participation in the Catholic ritual life of the colonial capital. A Jesuit missionary observed that during their three-week stay, the Illinois charmed us by their piety and by their edifying life. Every evening they recited the rosary, and every morning they heard me say mass. People crowded into the church to witness the spectacle of so-called savage Indians worshiping and singing before the altar. The highlight for the audience was a responsive Gregorian chant in which Ursula nuns chanted the first Latin couplet and the Illinois continued the other couplets in, the Catholic, uh, in their language in the same tone. The Illinois appeared to be very well educated in Catholic practice, pausing during their daily activities to recite a variety of prayers. To listen to them, concluded the priest, you would easily perceive that they took more delight and pleasure in chanting these holy canticles than the generality of the Indians. The missionary was correct in a sense. The inhabitants of some of the Illinois villages had developed a strong attachment to Christianity through years of interaction and exchange with the French. Illinois leaders, uh, Chicago and Mamantuensa, arrived in the city at the head of a delegation to show solidarity with their French allies who were embroiled in deadly conflicts with native nations in the lower Mississippi Valley. In an audience with the French governor, Chicago, presented two calumets, or ceremonial pipes, one symbolizing the shared French-Illinois attachment to Christianity, and the other the diplomatic and military alliance between them. The Illinois had, since the middle of the 17th century, engaged the French in calumet ceremonies to sustain friendly relations. In the 1690s, the Illinois converted in large numbers to Catholicism, adding a significant new dimension to the relationship. The connection now required two calumets, and one of these thoroughly uh, native ritual objects represented the religious traditions introduced by the French. This Catholic calumet became a symbol for the ways that the Illinois incorporated Catholicism into their lives. The calumet was a, an indigenous cultural vessel that now carried new meaning. Just as the Catholic prayers the Illinois chanted in the New Orleans church in their own native language, contained Illinois cultural concepts. Indeed, the Illinois defined themselves as Christian through the ritual of prayer, through religious practice. The New Orleans Jesuit commented that the Illinois were almost all of the prayer, that is, according to their manner of expression, that they are Christians. The Illinois term at the time, and this is the old fashioned Miami, Illinois, was Arminachiki, for those who pray. Our Minichiki spoke, sang, and chanted Illinois words in a new Christian order and context. These words could never be emptied entirely of their indigenous meaning. Ambiguity was a constant presence in the volatile colonial world the Indians and French made together in the 17th and 18th centuries. 
Effective navigation of this swiftly changing world required the kind of cultural creativity on vivid display in the houses of worship and colonial offices of New Orleans. And the appearance of a Catholic Calumet in 1730 represented the results of many decades of encounter and cultural translation. Religious encounters in the region brought people together in ways that promoted exchange across cultural borders, but not in a simple or straightforward fashion. Colonialism and its effects, the appearance of colonial officials, traders, and missionaries, the movements of native peoples, responding to pressures and to opportunities, the establishment and desertion of villages, forts, trading posts, and missions, the impact of warfare, disease, and alcohol, created unsteady formations on which to build new relationships. In the 17th and 18th centuries, a confluence of diverse peoples in a complex colonial environment contributed to the social and cultural transformation of the Upper Great Lakes and Mississippi Valley. Ultimately, generations of encounter produced a series of colonial conversions, the creation of hybrid cultural forms and religious practices that reflected both the movement and the persistence of boundaries. These interactions gave birth to the Catholic Calumet that Illinois presented to their French friends. And I want to say just a few words about the problems I have with traditional concepts of conversion most of which depend on some sort of idealized renovation of imperial subjects from so-called savages to Christians. But I find this uh, approach or this concept uh, insufficient to deal with the complexity of the situation I encountered in these histories. So I've argued instead for a more plural, dynamic, and flexible concept of conversion that accounts for the changes in all participants, including the missionaries, actually. And I focus on religious action orientation and movement, song and speech, ritual and relationships, more than on faith and doctrine. I'm interested in Armin Chiki, those who pray. And I was gratified that my publishers allowed me to include two epigraphs at the beginning of the book, uh, one of them from my uh, favorite band, Wilco, a Chicago band. And in their song, Theologians, they sing, Theologians, they don't know nothing about my soul. I have nothing against theologians. I have a lot of colleagues who are theologians at my university. Um, but I'm more interested in practice than in doctrine. The other part of the epigraph is from a film that I um, admire very much, John Sayles' 1996 film, Lone Star, in which one of the characters is arguing against the kind of abstraction that the artificiality of borders uh, forces onto people. And he, he, he insists, I'm talking about people here not abstractions. And this fits the approach that I took, which was to focus on the humanity of the, uh, and the experience of the participants in these religious encounters. So I tried very hard in my interpretive journey through the native villages and missions of the Pai Dono or upper country to provide a textured description of religious life in these multicultural communities, one that recognizes the humanity of all participants. It has been all too easy for scholars to deny the sincerity of missionaries and to dismiss the genuine engagement of native peoples with Christianity. While the connection between missionization and larger colonial systems is undeniable, the corrective trend toward critical accounts of missionization has generated a strong bias against Christianity as an authentic expression of Indian religiosity. In, analysis, in an analysis of native Christianity, scholar James Treat observes that Native Christians have been called heretical, inauthentic, assimilated, and uncommitted. They have long endured intrusive definitions of personal identity and have quietly pursued their own religious visions, often under the very noses of unsuspecting missionaries, anthropologists, agents, and activists. Christian missionization unquestionably supported colonization, dispossession, and the destruction of Native cultures. And yet the adoption and indigenization, as well as the rejection of Christianity, represented thoughtful and varied responses to colonization. And I'd like to share a few examples of these creative and ambiguous encounters here this morning. At the end of April 1670, the Jesuit missionary Claude Alloway left the newly established mission of St. Mark among the Meskwakis to visit other nearby Algonquian-speaking nations. He traveled south to a multicultural village of Miami's, Mascoutens, and Illinois, where he received a warm welcome. The Indians invited Alloway and his French companions into a cabin, served them refreshments, 
and rubbed their tired feet and legs with oil. They offered the missionary tobacco and referred to him as a Manitou, requesting that he use his power to protect them from famine, disease, and dangerous enemies. Although Alloway stressed his own limited power in his response, he also wanted to be associated with the authority and omnipotence of God. Alloway was dismayed, however, that they offered us, he said, a veritable sacrifice like that which they make to their false gods. Later in the evening, Alloway presented several gifts of glass beads and metal knives and axes, and he described the basic principles of Christianity and outlined the expectations of God. Alloway acknowledged that these good people only half understood me, but if the Indians did not comprehend his instructions in literal terms, he felt strongly that the more general spiritual sense of the teachings was already having an impact. Alloway returned to the village in the autumn to continue his mission, accompanied by the soon-to-be uh, superior of the Jesuit missions, Claude d'Ablon. The, inhabit the inhabitants were keenly interested in the potential power they perceived in the French visitors. Dablon reported that they invited us to many feasts, not so much for the sake of eating as of obtaining through us either recovery from their ailments or good success in their hunting and in war. Alloway and Dablon wanted to credit God for any power that they were able to summon, but they also felt compelled to display such power and thereby meet native expectations. The priests instructed and publicly baptized a boy of 10 or 12 years who had been seriously ill and seemed in danger of dying. The young boy, given the name Francois in the ceremony, recovered from his illness, according to Dablon. Although the missionaries were more interested in Francois' spiritual health, the boy's physical recovery must have provided real evidence for native, ob native observers that the missionary had access to considerable power. The French strangers brought novel technologies, exotic objects, and unfamiliar spiritual practices to a precarious world, and native peoples wondered whether these foreigners would also help bring new order to the region, or whether they would make an already difficult situation worse. The obvious power and yet ambiguous potential of the French caused native peoples to approach them with intense interest, as well as a prudent sense of cir circumspection. Alloway believed that the, the Indians honored him as a powerful god or spirit when they called him Manitou and offered him tobacco. This interpretation of native responses was common among the French, as was the idea that Manitous were sometimes the equivalent of demons. The French Jesuit scholar uh, Joseph Francois Lafiteau explained, these spirits are all the subaltern beings. They enjoy for the most part an evil character being more disposed to evil than good. The Indians do not fail to be their slaves and pay them more honor than they pray the great spirit whose nature is good. The Manitou concept was considerably more complex than that, a point that many French observers eventually recognized. The influential French diplomat, trader, and interpreter, Nicolas Perrault, had a dramatic and very personal encounter with some Miamis that highlights this complexity. In late spring of 1671, Perot traveled to a Miami settlement where the Miamis ceremoniously greeted Perot and his Potawatomi escort outside the town in full martial regalia. They conducted the visitors into the village and tried to make them comfortable. Days later, they entertained uh, their guests with an exciting but violent game of lacrosse. After the game, a woman approached Perot to tell him about her sick son who suffered from terrible stomach pains. She asked the Frenchman if, since he was a spirit, this is from the account, he had not the power to heal him. Perot administered a dose of medicine that he carried and the man seemed to improve immediately. Three prominent men later woke the Frenchman in the middle of the night and offered him a gift of ten beaver skins for some of the powerful remedy. Although Perot explained that he did not really want to share his limited supply of the drug, in order to avoid offending his hosts, he accepted the beaver robes and gave them half of the medicine. It is their custom, he wrote, to make presents to those who have spirits, thus they call remedies, which they believed could not produce their effect if one refused their presence. This account gives a much better idea of the larger meaning of the term Manitou, which could, descri could describe an extraordinary person or spirit, as well as the medicine or power that they could manipulate. 
Miami, Illinois language material produced by the Jesuits gives some insight into these meanings and shows that the missionaries eventually developed a more nuanced understanding of the concept. The early 18th century French uh, Miami, Illinois dictionary credit to uh, Jean Le Boulanger contains a number of entries for the term. The manuscript translated Manitou as genie or spirit and provided possessive constructions like the Manitouma for my Manitou and Amina Tumare for his Manitou. The dictionary also included active phrases like Nimanatukara, I make it Manitou, and Nimanatuki, I, have, I make a Manitou of something. Another dictionary translated the first of these phrases, Nimanatukara, as I consider it or respect it as a god. The idea that Indians welcomed the French as gods overstated the issue in many ways. The French interpreted the native rituals conducted to maintain agreeable relationships with Manitous as religious worship in the European sense. This view compelled the missionary to offer a response like the Illinois phrase, Nimanatuisa, I am not a god. I apologize for my pronunciation. The tobacco rituals Alloway witnessed seemed to indicate that he was perceived as a god, but native concepts of person and power were more inclusive and flexible than European definitions. Indian worldviews recognized both human and other than human beings as persons, as agents, with the ability to interact with other persons and with the surrounding world. Other than human beings included spirits that were rarely seen, manitous that governed human relationships with animals, and some potent phys physical objects like the Calumet. Power differentiated, differentiated one person from another, either within a particular category or between the human and other than human categories. Some persons had access to more power than others did. If Alloway had declared that he was not a Manitou, his listeners likely heard him claim that he was not spiritually powerful. Whether or not they believed his protests or appreciated his intricate explanations of the difference between their Manitous and his own is another story. Alloway discovered the strength of these religious traditions and inter intergenerational relationships in his encounters with the Miami Akima, or captain. The Miami leader had hosted the priest at one time and expressed some interest in Christianity, but he would not make a commitment. Disappointed, Alloway decided to defer the man's baptism. Although he seemed sufficiently well disposed, the missionary explained, he could not, on account of his rank as captain, through courtesy, refrain from involving himself in the uh, rituals of the young men. Alloway never did baptize the captain, and presumably the Miami man upheld his alliances with the young men in his community. New leaders emerged by consistently achieving success, thus demonstrating their skill and power and enhancing their prestige. Instruction, spiritual guidance, and acquiring a Manitou, and leadership linked generation to generation. The relationships formed in these enterprises cemented ties between young and old, gifts and the ideal of reciprocity maintain the bonds. As one missionary noted, even the young men who had become interested in Christianity and had already started to alter their behavior could not give up their dreams, visions, and manitous when it came to warfare. It was simply too risky, unless there were obvious signs that Christianity could successfully augment or replace the power upon which they had been trained to rely. Identifying areas of convergence between Indian and French cultures created important and often the earliest opportunities to experiment with the power of Christianity. An episode from a Miami and Mascouten village west of Lake Michigan presents a clear demonstration of substantive engagement across cultures, as well as the uncertainty that always seemed to go along with it. In 1676, the Jesuit Antoine Sylvie praised a man he called Joseph for his piety and his dedication to prayer. When Sylvie arrived at his mission, few of the several thousand inhabitants of the village claimed to be Christian. The chapel was often full, but most people appeared only out of curiosity not to pray with the missionary. Joseph was an exception. Sylvie thought him the most remarkable of all the older Christians. The priest provided his superiors an example in his report. And this is a, a quotation. From the account, an accident that greatly surprised me happened recently to this poor man while I was saying mass, at which he was very devoutly assisting. 
For when I was at the consecration and was elevating the sacred host, he suddenly fell into such convulsions that he seemed like one possessed. He was, Sylvie continued, brought to himself, and after Mass, when I wished to know the cause of the accident, I was greatly consoled on learning that it was none other than the respectful awe that the good Christian felt at that august mystery. According to Sylvie, Joseph also always requested new prayers to incorporate into his ritual routines. He asked for a brief rosary of seven or eight words in his own language. And he said it with such special attention and affection that he inspired me with devotion and gave me unequal pleasure, Sylvie wrote. It would be an exceeding consolation to have many neophytes <laughs> like him. Joseph seemed particularly concerned with calling down divine protection for a son who had gone off to war. Joseph's assistants, alongside the missionary as well as the trance he endured during the Mass, point toward the very real possibility that Joseph had, had identified important intersections or convergences between Christianity and indigenous religious practices. Joseph may, in fact, have apprenticed himself to the missionary to become a kind of Christian healer who could operate in both worlds. Sylvie per perceived him as the ideal neophyte, helpful, enthusiastic, and pious in practice, but Joseph's performance at the Mass would have been even more familiar in the large public ceremonies that were common in these native villages. The French trader and colonial official Pierre Deliette described these ceremonies among the Miami and Illinois in a memoir he left after many years of service in the Illinois country. Deliette wrote, two or three times in the summer, in the most attractive spot in the village, they plant some poles in the ground, forming a sort of enclosure which they furnish with mats. As people prepare the ceremonial ground, the medicine men and women convened in a cabin to discuss their plans and get themselves ready for the coming rites. At the appointed time, the men and women entered the enclosure and sat down. A leader rose to address the healers in the assembled crowd. My friends, he instructed, today you must manifest to men the power of our medicine so as to make them understand they live only as long as we wish. Shaking their gourd rattles and chanting, the healers called on their Manitous in turn. Immediately, according to Deliette, three or four men get up as if possessed, among them some who resemble men who are on the point of dying. Their eyes are convulsed and they let themselves fall prostrate and grow rigid as if they were expiring. In the climax of the ceremony, the healers expelled the offending Manitous from the ailing men using their own spirits and powers. Deliette argued dismissively that these medicine men and women conducted the ceremonies to instill fear and uphold their power and influence in the community. On the other hand, the pattern seems remarkably similar to the mass Sylvie described. Such masses typically took place inside a small wooden chapel or an especially prepared ground with large wooden cross towering over the scene. Sylvie would have arrived to say mass with all his priestly accoutrement and was called the assembly to worship. Joseph stood by as his assistant. At a critical moment in the mass, Sylvie elevated the sacred host for the consecration, and Joseph fell into a trance as if possessed. In this case, the body and blood of Jesus Christ induced the trance and the power of God pulled Joseph out of it so that he could continue his worship. Joseph worked closely with Sylvie before and after the spectacular event to, aid, to add to his repertoire of prayers <clears throat> and then used acquired rituals to seek protection for his family. Sylvie viewed him as the model convert. Joseph and others around him may have been just as impressed with his special access to new manitous and spiritual power. Such events with all their ambiguity became a common feature of the colonial conversions that transformed the religious landscape of the Piedano in the 17th and 18th centuries. The distance traveled from this moment, from this early encounter, to the presentation of a Catholic calumet in New Orleans some decades later was indeed a long and difficult journey marked by uncertainty. It was pre precisely this pervasive element of ambiguity, however, that supported the formation of new relationships and the creative exchange of spiritual gifts, powerful and attractive to some, threatening and still dangerous to others. Yishimeru. We have time for two questions, if you have any. Thank you.
Any questions? All right, well then we will move on. Thank you very much.